<laughs> also, also, this year is the 40th anniversary of Japan's number one. Now, looking back during the half century about Asian story, first is Japan miracle, the story, then the Four Little Dragon, yes. then China story. Yeah. You are so good at picking topic. <laughs> what's, what's, what's the secret? <laughs> yeah. Why well, I picked them? Mm. Partly is luck because once it's luck, two, twi two times maybe luck, but well, so many uh, years. First, what I tell you about Japan, mm -hmm. you know, before I went to Japan, mm -hmm. I had about one year when I knew mm -hmm. I would likely go there. Mm -hmm. So at that time, there were not many good social science studies. Mm -hmm. So I tried to read all different disciplines. I read history, economics. Uh, political science, mm. tried to get a broad background. Mm. And then I tried to find some particular study where I could go deeper. Mm. I'm not a historian. My PhD thesis is on uh, families of Irish-American, Italian-American, old American families, mm. and emotionally disturbed children. Mm. So when I started out in Japan, I first started to study uh, mental health of children. But then one day, one of my Japanese uh, families said, you know, there's a difference between salary men and uh, other families. And that uh, little polite, that's really interesting. It's a sort of openness to the big ideas. The, the, the new middle class did not mean just they just got rich. It meant that the structure of those families' life when they worked for a big organization was very different from the independent business people. Mm. So as a whole structure became a new topic. Mm. So on the way to Japan, mm. uh, I visited, uh, my wife and I had never traveled abroad. Mm. So we wanted to see the world. So in those days, you could get an airplane ticket and stop in every country. Mm. And when I went to England, this is 1958, mm. there were still many rubbles on the street mm. from World War II bombing. Mm. And Japan was already cleaned up. Mm -hmm. It was very poor. Even the main streets uh, of Tokyo, mm -hmm. to me, were like alleys. Mm -hmm. But they were working very hard. Mm -hmm. I knew some of the facts, mm -hmm. but I never thought about what's the big picture. Mm -hmm. I think the big picture is going from a structure where you had clans in Japan mm -hmm. to a broader administrative structure that transition from an organization of clans working together to a broader administrative state mm. that has its own structure and ideology and mm. so forth. And once I could see that broader perspective, a lot of the details mm. fell in place. So that was uh, my first book that ended New Middle Class. And then from 1960 until 75, I did not spend, I went every year, mm. but not though for a long time. 75 to 76, I went back for a whole year. Mm -hmm. When I was there, I realized, whoo, Japan is really coming up. Mm -hmm. And it has the potential for having much bigger impact on the world. And I'll give you an example of one country, and I think it was Peru. Mm -hmm. I talked to a local guy who, he started out as the dealer for a Japanese uh, motorbike. He was so amazed at how uh, rational the Japanese were, how hard they worked, and how they maintained quality, mm. that he learned how to do modern quality, and he influenced some other people. Mm. That's when I began writing Japan as number one. So uh, maybe I hadn't thought about it this way. If I, if I say, what's my pattern of uh, picking a big thing? Mm. It's I start from, you know, what is interesting. And then I say, oh, here's a big picture. And it's a kind of a new thing. I guess that maybe is my secret. That, that mm -hmm. I, I, I keep thinking intellectually. And then I say, what is the big picture? And how does it fit together? What's really important is happening. Mm -hmm. And I suddenly hit on that. And that, that, that I think, the, the, the big books I wrote, Japan is number one, and uh, Dung really came from that. Mm. Yeah. I'm, I'm so curious uh, how to keep your I mean, energy, <laughs> keep your ambition, I mean, still try to engage something big. So what's, what's, what's the motivation? 
Well, I'm not very happy in the United States what happened to political science and sociology. In the last uh, 20, 30 years, uh, they have become, they want to be scientific. Mm -hmm. And uh, they can use new quantitative measures. Get a sample of 5,000, and they, this is correlated to this. Mm -hmm. But from my point of view, they don't do enough to see what is the context and what is the social background? Mm. What is the history? So the kind of research that I like where you really get to know people and see historical context and see broad context is not so popular. Mm. Uh, the other thing is universities now have become too bureaucratic. We have so many problems with females, how you handle females and how you handle blacks and transgender. So the dean, instead of thinking just scholarly, spends so much time worrying about social issues, which are important, but from trying to build the intellectual uh, vitality, mm -hmm. they don't, they, they, their mind is so busy with so many mm -hmm. different things mm -hmm. like this. So, of course, in the whole world, I would say one of the fundamental differences is people become so detailed, they do not see the big picture. Mm -hmm. There are so many talented people who lost their confidence about civilization. Hi, Charlotte. Uh, good to see you. One and a half a year ago, I met Mr. Vogel in Hong Kong. We have an arrangement to meet in Boston, but sorry for your big loss. Sorry. Mm. Mm. Yeah, Mr. Vogel, he told me Hong Kong, so Charlotte is so smart. <laughs> he, he said lots of good words about you. I'm curious because we talk about Mr. Vogel's books, uh, thoughts, he was so energetic. From your perspective, what propelled him to do so much? Well, I, I think it's, it's very interesting what, what happened. He was, according to him, I wasn't there, but he achieved very well. He went through high school in three years. He went through college in three years. He took courses during the summer. I mean, he had his master's degree, I think, at 20, something like that. But he didn't have to kill himself. He was a good scholar. It was relatively easy. He could lead a fuller life. And I think what might have kind of kicked him into high gear was when he came back from Japan, he had a job offer from Columbia. And so he and his wife decided to sell the house and, uh, you know, think about moving to New York. So he came up to Harvard, so went through the process of selling the house and dropped in on one of his former professors, um, John Pelzel. And they chatted. And it turned out that Harvard and actually several other major universities around the country had just been given the mission to develop a whole new generation of China scholars. We had just gone through the McCarthy period of purging. I don't, purging is probably too strong a word, word but um, casting suspicion on a lot of older scholars who had studied China, you know, maybe they were communist leaning. And so once that was over, there was a decision made to start generating a whole new cohort of scholars to study China. And Pelzel said to Ezra, you, you know, would you like to do China? Ezra had never taken a China course, didn't speak Chinese. Chinese is nothing like Japanese. I mean, a lot of Americans think, oh, you just go from one to the other. I mean, as you know, they are <laughs> totally different. And Ezra said, oh, uh, wow, China. <laughs> he said, so he said he might be interested. So Pelzel got on the phone, called Fairbank and said, you know, Ezra might be interested in this. This is all happening in the space of a long weekend. So Fairbank came over. He, he thought Ezra was a good candidate, and Ezra had to explain, uh, actually, I have to tell Columbia by the end of this weekend whether or not I'm going to accept that job. So they said, okay, you can have the Harvard job. <laughs> and I think that was when he really started to 
feel burdened that he was going to have to really work like mad to justify that appointment. I mean, he was so glad to have the opportunity to be involved in a great change. And he was panicked about having to appear as a China expert on the basis of a three-year fellowship out of the blue. You know, it was this constant need to prove himself worthy of that trust that kept him going. I mean, we knew he was a workaholic. Who doesn't know that? Uh, he was just very, very conscientious uh, from a spouse and kid's point of view, more conscientious than we would have liked. And this was shortly after Ezra had died. And all kinds of people were saying, you know, how much Ezra meant to him. I mean, professional people, former students, people who had been fellows at Harvard, this kind of thing, who I, who I just met him. And so I asked the kids, how, how do you feel when you hear all of these people praising your father? And I didn't even give them a chance to answer. I said, I'll tell you how I feel. I feel annoyed. And they burst out laughing because they felt exactly the same way. Why is he giving all of these people all of this time when we feel he's giving them our time? So what's your first impression on Guangzhou? I mean, in 1980s, you went to Guangzhou together? Yes, that was part of a Harvard alumni tour, which, believe it or not, was doubling as our honeymoon. We had gotten married only a month earlier, mm -hmm. and he thought this would be so exciting. We could spend our honeymoon in China. But it seemed very tense. Um, we just felt that people were very nervous around foreigners. I mean, we were Americans. Mm -hmm. We hadn't, well, we had only recently established diplomatic relations. Um, so I, I just think, you know, nobody quite knew how friendly they should be. You know, we both love interviewing. We both love hearing what people think about situations. I mean, it broadens your own perspective, but we had different objectives. He was trained as a sociologist. He was interested in the macro level. How were these major changes taking place? How was policy developed? This kind of thing. I am an anthropologist. My primary data source is the ordinary person. What is their take on what's going on? Mm -hmm. And so in a way, we were able to integrate. He would, you know, in the evening, he could say, wow, I interviewed, you know, vice governor so-and-so or the head of bureau so-and-so. And, -so, and <laughs> and they said, blah, 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 blah. And then I'd say, oh, well, you know, I interviewed these three families. But um, people were very nervous. He was never a person who, you know, was celebrity conscious. But he began to realize that he had access that a lot of other scholars do not have. And he did want to use that to benefit everybody, not just the United States, but specifically to promote good relations between the U.S. and China. You said before that you would study other countries because you want to use others' experience to maybe enlighten the United States yeah. during the past Five decades you travel yeah. deeply into China and Japan. And yes. So what's the major things you want to bring to the United States, to Americans? Well, unfortunately, they don't listen enough. <laughs> you know, to, if I really want to try to make America, if I really had power mm. and really want to have fundamental, I think the experience of the countries that were late developers, mm. where the country takes a more active role and trying to, to guide the whole country would be really good. For example, uh, we have good suburbs, that have good schools, and poor neighborhoods. We have very poor schools, very poor teachers. If you had a national ministry of education, you would, you would really try to have a national program, and you would have federal money, national money, to help the backward schools, so you'd have a much more equal educational system. Mm -hmm. 
So if I really had power and really want to use the example of uh, Japan and China, mm. I would say the government should take a much more active role. Mm. But I'm afraid America can't do that. I mean, we don't, we're not a late developer mm. and now people have too much pride. But uh, in some ways, I think my vision is bigger. I mean, you know, it's a very important intellectual task for the whole world. Mm. The grand vision, mm. you know, like Toynbee in the West had a mm. big grand vision, mm. and maybe some earlier period had a mm. grand vision. But I think now people are not uh, looking forward enough. For example, mm. the, the bureaucrats I knew in the 1950s, the, that generation who were thinking how you build a modern Japan mm. were really very broad. And the bureaucrats now mm. are much pettier. You know, they, they've become too small. Mm. I, I, I think that, you know, there are historical changes mm. in different uh, time periods. Whether you have a broad vision makes a big difference. For example, you know, humiliation uh, it could be used in different ways. Mm. It could be used as a stimulus to study and to learn more, mm. to build a modern organization. Mm. The Meiji is, as I say, it's a modernization mm. program and an integrated program and succeeded, but then they had years of disaster mm. in the 1930s. They had taught patriotism so successfully that uh, the leaders could not control it. And uh, the defeat by the United States was so devastating, mm. and they suffered so much. And then they had to revise, and now they have to accept a new role in the world. I mean, in a way, it's not so glorious. Japan must accept uh, China as number one in Asia, and America is a much greater, bigger country. Mm. They can be a modern country, but it's uh, not so exciting. Mm how to adjust to this new world. They don't have a clear vision. I think in China also, um, China is new powerful, mm -hmm. and they have not yet become comfortable with their power. Now when they go to many other countries, uh, some of the instinct is, look, we're the big shot, please listen to us. Mm -hmm. There are some people like that. And some other people say, now to get along mm. as we expand, mm. we cannot be too proud. Mm. That is a good way. But my impression is that they use a lot of slogans, mm. but they haven't tried to be systematic. They did not have an overall systematic plan about learning from the world in every single area. Geography, local customs, the value system, the religion, the family structure, mm how to use, how to persuade, and how to have deep understanding of people that deeper feelings. Mm. Mm. Uh, for example, in the United States, propaganda is not a good way to persuade Americans. Mm. In the long run, this will not succeed very well. Mm. So they do not have yet the mature vision mm. about how to adapt to the rest of the world as they grow. From uh, America point of view, um, I think after World War II, in a way, it was kind of a peak. Mm. Uh, we were the one great country in the world uh, mm. with modern industry. Mm. And now China will surpass America in some places. And uh, we don't have a plan. I think our leaders, they have an instinctive reaction from the Cold War. We won't let another country pass. And a lot of people in Washington just want to criticize China, mm. jump on China. But they don't have a vision of how to work with China now. I mean, from my point of view, human civilization is not just about business interests, economic growth, mm -hmm. or new technology breakthrough. Mm -hmm. It's a broader conception. It's a kind of an intellectual development of trying to think the big picture of what is happening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the public intellectual tradition. In, yes. in 1960s, 70s, and, and the 80s, public intellectual play a very important role in understanding other countries. Now it's become more marginal. There is a deeper problem. I mean, 
comparing with the older generation. People think not curious about different behavior, mentality of others, civilization. We are very self-centered. From your perspective, how to deal with? I, I, I don't know the answer. I wish I knew. Uh, I think it has to do with the new connection between uh, communication and, and uh, so forth. Mm. But what will be the basis of a healthy relations? Mm. It's true. I mean, in the last uh, 20 years, the world became chaotic. Mm. And out of the chaos, the people went off in different directions. So I don't know that answer. But I think uh, what I can do, and maybe have some impact, I hope, is how to deal with China. Mm. And there's some things Americans may not like about what's going on in China, but you have to be realistic. After all, China is going to be strong, and there are a lot of good Chinese people you can work with. If Zhong King Fairbank alive, what do he do? He... In a way, he, he did not have such a broad goal as I do. Mm. He wanted to have better relations with China, but his uh, vision was more in terms of the field of Chinese studies. Uh, I would say one of the fundamental differences with Fairbank and me is he was elitist. He was uh, from higher class than I, mm -hmm. and uh, more, more, he went to Oxford and Rhodes Scholar mm -hmm. and so forth, uh, and I was a more or a Putunian, mm -hmm. uh, you know, my father was a small Jewish merchant, mm -hmm. and I work in the store. And uh, my father had a very good attitude of trying to get along with everybody mm -hmm. and to become very familiar and very friendly. It was a town of about 10,000, and uh, the small college, Ohio Wesleyan, which is a Methodist town, uh, maybe partly because it was a religious town, uh, there were many Christians there, although I was Jewish. It gave me a sense that uh, I want to be friends with everyone. Mm -hmm. And it also it was World War II. So we had friends who went to the war. We knew, knew people who died during the war. My generation after the war, we really wanted to have world peace. Mm -hmm. And uh, in some ways, I think I'm so lucky. I grew up in such small town America. Mm -hmm. I was given the opportunity to experience in a, so many historical changes. Mm. And that to me means so much responsibility. Not because I thought that was so important, but because I thought their relations were so bad and I really want to make, I mean, that's, that's the honest way. I, I re really want those people to get along because there's so many good people in both countries mm. and there ought to be a better way. And I, and I knew a lot of people, I want them to get along. Mm. So maybe, maybe I'm uh, immodest. Maybe I'm not correct, but uh, I think uh, I have a contribution to make. So, do you think, I mean, there, there was a golden age between China and the United States, but now we have so many different complex between each other. So, I mean, the, the, the transition, how the transition happen? It's You know, of course, you know, every country like China and the United States is big and we have many different people. You know, the extreme rightists, mm -hmm. the extreme leftists. Mm -hmm. They don't have the confidence and the vision mm -hmm. to really develop a understanding of each other. So how, how to find a new path, you know, I'm afraid it could be so hard in the near future. But, well, it's also, you know, I think of the missionaries. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'll give you one example. I knew a Guangdong a guy, a guy named Yang Mai. Mm. The exchange with people whose experiences are different from one's own is very illuminating. There are other ways to think. And I think that right now, that kind of attitude in this country is so necessary. Right now in the U.S., we are so divided that we cannot come to the middle. I mean, as we wrote China and Japan facing history, somebody needs to write the book now, America, right and left, facing history. Maybe I'll write that, no. But uh, no, it's, it's uh, people are so closed-minded. And the sad thing is, 
It's not just the other side. It's one's own side. You know, we're not willing to even talk. Um, when Trump won the election, I was surprised. Mm -hmm. But I immediately looked for all the books that I could find that related to what the other side might be thinking or experiencing and that might contribute to my understanding of why this was happening. Yeah. And I spoke to some, to a good friend. Oh, you know, I'm reading this and that and the other thing and trying to understand the other side. And she just looked at me and said, why would you want to understand the other side? They're all racists. End of story. And this is an intelligent person mm. whose opinion I normally respect. And she's still my very good friend. But wouldn't, I mean, why would I even try to understand another side? Surprised her. Mm. People are just absolutely closed. Mm. That's, we don't need that. We don't need that in, a, in the same country. We certainly do not need that mm. between China and the mm. U.S. People need to understand why there are different points of view and how can you find a middle ground. I mean, we both sincerely wish people could listen to other people and respect their opinions or at least understand them. So you discuss the issue with Ezra a lot? You oh, very yeah. often? Well, I wouldn't say a lot. I mean, you know, we're sitting there at the kitchen table. I'm reading the Boston Globe. He's reading the New York Times. Now I have to read the New York Times myself. Um, hmm. And I'll say, oh, did you see this story on blah, blah, blah? Or Trump is doing X, Y, Z. Yeah, I mean, we would discuss them like that or something terrible. I mean, I am so glad. I mean, it's just going to sound stupid. I'm so glad he didn't see January 6th. It would have broken his heart. Recently, I always think of Yang Mai. This is a guy who went to Yenjing University in, in, in the graduate of the late 1940s. He was studying uh, Western economics, mm. uh, a free market economics. In 1949, he knew, oh boy, I will never get ahead. Mm. I, will, I will fail. Mm. So he became an engineer. So for, from 1949 until the early 1980s, he had no zoyum, male fahui zoyum. But in the Guangdong at the time of the late 80s, because he knew how markets operated. Suddenly he's useful now. <laughs> exactly. So mm. suddenly, you know, he would go to a county mm. and the guy, the guy in the county would say, you know, how do we get enterprise here? Mm. So he played a very useful, constructive role. And he was my friend. He was, he was my good friend in Guangdong. Uh, and I, I learned a lot from him. You know, in the whole world, there are so many talented people Sometimes they have no chance, you know, uh, it's sad, but they never, but sometimes some of those people have a chance later. So when I hear people say engagement didn't work, I say it's crazy. Yeah, you know, history has not ended today. Mm -hmm. Some of those people who had very good understanding, now they must be very careful, but maybe 10 years later they could play very constructive role in development around the world. And now they it would need to be organized and to give them more opportunity, mm. more freedom to develop bigger ideas. So uh, I won't give up. 